good evening everyone welcome to today's lecture on ecosystem so in the last lecture we had a discussion about what is ecosystem basically ecosystem in, involves the study of interactions between the uh, living organisms and the abiotic components that are present in the environment so we study various aspects of ecosystem uh, from that in that aspects we study uh, firstly, we studied about uh, what are the different aspects like nutrient cycling, energy flow, decomposition, productivity, etc. So, in the last lecture, we discussed about the productivity, that what is a net productivity, what is a gross primary productivity, etc. And we discussed what is, a, uh, what is decomposition and what is the decomposition cycle. So, in today's lecture, we will discuss more about the energy flow. So, except for the deep sea hydrothermal ecosystem where uh, the source of the energy is not the sun, for rest of the all ecosystems on the earth, sun is the only source of energy. Of the total incident solar radiation that is received on the earth, less than 50% of it is photosynthetically active radiation that is PAR. And out of this, plants only capture 2 to 10 percent of the power and only this small amount of energy is enough to sustain the entire living world. We know that all the living organisms are dependent for their food on producers either directly or indirectly. These producers are usually the photosynthetic plants that produce the food by harnessing the solar energy and by harnessing the solar energy they produce the food that is in a uh, it taken up or eaten up by the herbivores and then herbivores are eaten by the carnivores. So in this manner, the flow of energy takes place in the environment, in the ecosystem. So all the organisms are dependent for their food on producers either directly or indirectly. There is always a unidirectional flow of energy from the sun to the producers and then to the consumers. So, when we talk about the flow of energy in, an, in any ecosystem, the flow of energy in any ecosystem will always be unidirectional. So, the energy of the sun is harnessed by the plants or the producers and that energy is then taken up by the consumers. So, this is the direction of the flow of energy and there is a unidirectional flow of energy in the ecosystem from the sun to the producers and then to the consumers. Further, ecosystems uh, also follow the thermodynamic law of uh, laws of thermodynamics and it also follows the second law of thermodynamics. So we know that according to the second law of thermodynamics, so what second law of thermodynamics states? So second law of thermodynamics states that any spontaneously occurring process will always lead to an escalation in the entropy of the universe. That is, any process that is occurring spontaneously or for any process to occur spontaneously in nature, it always leads to the increase in the free energy or the entropy of the universe. In simple words, this law explains that an isolated system's entropy will never decrease over the time. So, ecosystem also follows the same law and it also needs a constant supply of energy which is provided by the sun to synthesize the molecules they require to counteract the universal tendency towards increasing the disorderliness. So the green plants in the ecosystem that harness this energy to synthesize the molecules which can be utilized by them as well as which can be utilized by the uh, other organisms like the herbivores and the carnivores. So the green plants in the ecosystem are known as the producers as they produce the uh, pro, as they harness the solar energy to produce the products that can further be used by the uh, consumers. So in a terrestrial ecosystem that is the one uh, on the land, major producers are herbaceous and woody plants. So if I talk about the terrestrial ecosystem that is the land ecosystem, major producers or most of the production is done by the herbaceous and the woody plants. While if I talk about the producers in an eco aquatic ecosystem, 
So in an aquatic ecosystem, there are various species like phytoplankton, algae and higher plants that contributes in the production of the energy uh, that, con that are the major producers. So if I talk, uh, so just repeating this statement again, that if someone asks that what are the major producers in a terrestrial ecosystem, so in a terrestrial ecosystem, herbaceous and woody plants are the major producers. While if I talk about the aquatic ecosystem, there are various species like phytoplanktons. So phytoplanktons are the present are the plants that are present in water. Algae and higher plants are the major producers. So as discussed earlier also that all animals depend on the plants directly or indirectly. So they are hence called consumers or also known as heterotrophs. The plants are also known as producers or autotrophs, while the consumers are known as the heterotrophs. So if the consumers directly feed on the producers, the plants, they are called as the primary consumers. And if the animals eat other animals, which in turn eat the plants or they are produced, they are called secondary consumers. So the ones, the consumers that directly feed on the plants or the plant products are the primary consumers. So the herbivores come under the category of primary consumers. And if there is an animal that feeds on the, on any other animal that in turn eats the plant or the plant products, they are called as the secondary consumers. So carnivores come under the category of secondary consumers. Likewise, we could have a tertiary consumers too. The ones that feed on animal that has eaten the another animal. So basically the ones that feed on uh, the omnivores or the ones that, uh, sorry, the ones that feed on the primary carnivores are known as the tertiary consumers. So the, in short, what we can say is that the primary consumers will be herbivores. So herbivores are the ones that feed on the plant products directly. So the primary consumers will be the herbivores. Some common herbivores are insects, birds, and mammals in the terrestrial ecosystem and mollusks in the aquatic. Now, we also talked about the consumers that feed on these herbivores are known as the carnivores. And more precisely or more correctly, they can be called as primary carnivores or secondary carnivores depending on their feed. So the primary carnivores are the secondary consumers, that is the animals that eat other animals, which in turn have eaten plant products, while the other ones are the secondary carnivores. These are the animals that depend on the primary carnivores for their food. So this is how the classification of different, uh, classification of different consumers in an ecosystem exists. So consumers in any ecosystem are known as heterotrophs. And they can be classified as primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers, based on what their feed or what their food product is. So the primary consumers, as the name suggests, are the ones that directly feed on the producers. Secondary consumers are the ones that feed on primary consumers. And tertiary consumers are the ones that feed on the secondary consumers. So based on the uh, like just for a diagrammatic representation different organisms in ecosystem are related uh, we know that due to the uh, different dependency of food of different organisms on one another the organisms in an e any ecosystem are related to each other through different mechanisms of trophic level that is one organism is a food for another so the sequence of organisms that feed on one another forms a food chain. So this sequence is represented by a representation which is known as a food chain. So obviously, if I draw a food chain, the one which is at the uh, which which is at the start of the food chain is the producers, and the ones that are at the end of the food chain are the top carnivores. So the food chain is started by the consumers and it is ended with the top carnivore. The sequence of eating and being eaten, eating and being eaten produces transfer of food energy and it is known as the food chain. So basically the 
it also shows the direction of the transfer of energy from the producers to the top carnivores through various intermediates. Food chain is a linear sequence of organisms through which nutrients and energy pass as one organism eats another. So when producer, when the primary consumers feed on the producers, so nutrients and energy are passed on to the primary consumers. Similarly, when the secondary consumers feed on these primary consumers, they also uptake some of the nutrient and energy from this food. So this is how the transfer of energy, transfer of nutrients passes from one organism to another organism upon eating. So the producers, that is the green plants, grab the solar energy and convert this energy into chemical energy by the process which is known as the photosynthesis. So the glucose or the product of the photosynthesis is then taken up or eaten up by the plant uh, by the primary consumers and so the nutrients and the transfer of energy takes place to the primary consumers then these primary consumers are eaten up by the secondary consumers so the transfer of energy takes place to the secondary consumer now these small herbivores as i mentioned consume the plant matter and convert them in animal matter so the primary consumers are eaten up by the secondary consumers and so on. So this is how the cycle goes on in any ecosystem and this is represented by a linear sequence of organisms through which nutrients and energy pass as one organism eats another. And this representation or this linear sequence of organism that shows the transfer of energy and nutrients from one organism to another is known as the food chain. So there are different food chains that exist in any ecosystem. So for example, just a representation of one food chain is that the plant or the plant products are eaten up by the deer. Wolves then feed on the deer and this wolf, uh, when it dies, decomposers decompose this wolf and wolf and basically they release the inorganic nutrients into the soil, which is then again taken up by the plants. So this is how each and every organism is actually dependent on each other. Even the plants are dependent on the decomposers for the process of decomposition that allows the release of inorgan inorganic nutrients back into the soil so that the photosynthesis may take. Now this is an example of a single food chain. In any ecosystem, it is not necessarily that only a single type of food chain exists. So there may be a mingling of various food chains resulting in a structure which is known as the food web. So the crossing of different food chains is known as the food web as we can see in this diagram. So this diagram represents the food web where if I talk about a single food chain that is starting from the plants, let's say the grasshoppers feed on these plants. Now these grasshoppers are eaten up by the bird. Bird is then eaten up by the fox and so on. So in the same ecosystem, there might be another food chain that may be uh, working. For example, the plants may be eaten up by the ground squirrel. The ground squirrel may be eaten up by the eagle. Now, what may happen is that the grasshoppers eat the plant and this grasshopper is taken up by the ground squirrel and this ground squirrel is taken up, is eaten up by the fox. So, there are various numerous of food chains that, that at the same time exist in this ecosystem where these organisms are present. So, instead of the term food chain, it is better to define that in the form of food web where the same organism, for example, the ground squirrel may be a target of for more than one species. Like it may be a target for eagle or it may be a target for fox within the same ecosystem. So therefore, it is important to define that in the form of food web. So in ecosystem or in terrestrial ecosystem, uh, so basically there are two types of food chain about which we can talk about. So the first one is the grazing food chain and the second one is a uh, 
detritus food chain so the grazing food chain is the one in which the uh, the consumers which start the food chain utilizes the plant and the plant parts as their food constitute the grazing food chain now as mentioned here the grazing food chain begins from the green plant at the base and the primary consumers are the herbivores so the grazing food chain can be represented by the following figure that, that the grass which is the producer is eaten up by the goat which is the primary consumer or an herbivore then this is eaten up by the man which is the secondary consumer so this is an example or representation of a grazing food chain that may exist in an ecosystem it is very important to notice here that the grazing food chain begins from the green plants at the base and the primary consumers are the herbivores so this is important so that uh, so the grazing food chain may exist in an terrestrial ecosystem or in an aquatic ecosystem so if i talk about the grazing food chain in an terrestrial ecosystem so we can see that the plants are the primary producers which are eaten up by the caterpillars which are the primary consumers now these caterpillars are the targets for the lizard and uh, the lizard are secondary consumer and this lizard is then finally eaten up by the snake which is the tertiary consumer or we can say the top carnivore in this food chain so this is how the grazing food chain starting from the plants starting from the plant products start where herbivores are the primary consumer and ultimately it moves towards the carnivores similar type of grazing food chain not only exists in the terrestrial ecosystem but also in the aquatic ecosystem so we know that in an aquatic ecosystem the plants which are known as the phytoplanktons or the algae are the major uh, autotrophs that produces the energy or that harness the energy so the phytoplanktons are the primary producers which are eaten up by the zooplankton that is the animals that live in the water that lives in water so the small animals that lives in water which are zooplankton are the primary consumers that directly feeds on the phytoplankton now these zooplankton which are the small animals are eaten up by the fish which are the secondary consumers and this fish is then eaten up by the large fishes and uh, for example the pelican and uh, which is a tertiary consumer or or birds may be for example pelican and uh, this pelican may be a, will be a tertiary consumer so this is just one simple example of grazing food chain in an terrestrial ecosystem and in aquatic ecosystem in reality there are various numerous of food chains that exist together simultaneously within the same ecosystem the one which i represented for example the one which i represented as a food web so the next type of uh, food chain is the detritus food chain so detritus food chain as the name suggests starts with the dead organic matter so this is the basis of difference between the grazing food chain and the detritus food chain the grazing food chain starts with the green plants producing uh, food products for the primary consumers that is herbivore while the detritus food chain begins with the dead organic matter and it is made up of decomposers which are heterotrophic organisms mainly fungi and bacteria so these organisms like fungi and bacteria how do they meet their energy requirement so their energy requirement are met by degrading the dead organic matter or detritus so by degrading this dead organic matter or detritus these animals take up the energy these are these organisms are also known as the saprotrophs sapro means to decompose and decomposers what how do they decompose the material so basically these decomposers break down the dead and waste materials into simple inorganic material which are subsequently absorbed by them so these this is an enzymatic mechanism where these decomposers like bacteria or fungi secrete the enzymes digestive enzymes that break down the 
waste material, dead and waste material into simple inorganic materials which are subsequently absorbed by them. So, this is an example of a detritus food chain that starts with the dead organic matter that is dead leaves. These dead leaves are eaten by the wood louse. So, wood louse is a detritus here. Oh, sorry, the wood louse, uh, wood louse is a decomposer here and this wood louse decomposes this dead leaves and uh, take the energy from the decomposition of this dead leaves. Now, this wood louse can be eaten by the blackbird. So, this is how the detritus food chain works. So, what are the major differences between both the food chains? That is the grazing food chain and the detritus food chain. So, one most important point of difference is their point of initiation. So, as we see that in case of grazing food chain, the grazing food chain initiate from the green plants which are living, while the detritus food chain initiates from the decomposers and dead organic matter which are not living. So, the first trophic level are occupied by the producers. The first trophic level occupies by the detritivores. So, in this type of food chain, the flow of energy fraction is less. While if I talk about the detritus food chain, so in this type of food chain, the flow of energy fraction is high as compared to the grazing food chain. The binding of inorganic nutrients takes place in the grazing food chain while in case of detritus food chain, the binding of organic nutrients and the release of inorganic nutrients takes place. So, grazing food chain is directly dependent on the solar radiation influx as the plants require solar energy or the, uh, they require solar energy for the process of photosynthesis. While if I talk about the detritus food chain, the detritus food chain energy comes from the organic waste and dead matter which is known as the detritus. So, we see that in both the types of food chain that is in the grazing food chain or in the detritus food chain, there are various differences based on their point of initiation, their first trophic level which is occupied by producers in case of grazing food chain and detritivores in case of detritus food chain. On the basis of the flow of energy fraction, which is higher in case of detritus food chain and lower in case of grazing food chain. On the basis of whether they are releasing the inorganic nutrients or whether they are binding the inorganic nutrients. So, uh, the release of inorganic nutrients takes place in the detritus food chain while the binding of inorganic nutrients takes place in the grazing food chain. Also, this type of food chain is dependent directly on the solar radiation influx while the food chain energy comes from the organic waste and dead matter which is known as detritus in the detritus food chain. So, these are the basic differences between the two and this is also a very important question from the exam point of view. So, if I talk about the uh, aquatic ecosystem, the grazing food chain is a major conduit for the energy flow. As against this, in case of the terrestrial ecosystem, much larger fraction of energy flows through the detritus food chain than as compared to the grazing food chain. So, in case of the terrestrial ecosystem, it is the detritus food chain which is the which allows much larger fraction of energy flow as compared to the grazing food chain in a terrestrial ecosystem. While if I talk about the aquatic ecosystem, it is the grazing food chain which is the major conduit for the energy flow. So, the detritus food chain like in reality or in ecosystem or in any ecosystem, it is not like that the grazing food chain works independently and the detritus food chain works independently. In reality or in an, any natural ecosystem, the detritus food chain may be connected with the grazing food chain at some levels. For example, in this case also, we see that the wood louse is eaten up by the blackbird. Now, it is possible that this blackbird is eaten up by another carnivore or the top carnivore. So, this is how the grazing food chain or detritus food chain may be interconnected. And in natural ecosystems, some animals like cockroaches, crowd, crows, etc. are omnivores. That is, they feed on the plant products as well as on the animals. So, these are the major, um, like the omnivores are the point where the, are the major point in most of the uh, food chains where the 
detritus which may help in the connection of detritus food chain with the grazing food chain these natural interconnection of food chains make it a food web as described earlier also that in a, in an ecosystem the interconnection between different food chains makes a food web so it is very important that uh, that is why when we talk about the species biodiversity it is very important to conserve the species because the loss of any single species may affect the other entire ecosystem so if for example if in an in any ecosystem lizard become uh, like extinct so the it will be difficult for like the, there might be a chance that the snake does not get any food and therefore ultimately it also become extinct and also there might be a chance that the primary caterpillar uh, the primary consumer's caterpillar increases in number as there is no other consumer of these uh, will will be uh, existing in the ecosystem to control their number therefore it is very important for us to conserve the species we can see that through the food web or through the food chain all the species are interdependent from each other and this interdependency is very important for the survival of any particular species in the ecosystem so this is an example of how the uh, detritus food chain may be combined with the grazing food chain so we see that there are plant products like fruits that may be degraded by the fungi or the earthworm now these eaten up by the sparrow and the snake eaten take feeds on the sparrow the snake is then eaten up by the hawk so this is how one single food chain is working now if i talk about another food chain in this same ecosystem so this fungi can be like this uh, fish can feed on these clams or the fungi can also feed on these clams and then this fish can be eaten up by the hawk so hawk here in this ecosystem is a top carnivore similarly bear is also the top carnivore in this ecosystem so this is how numerous food chains exist together in the ecosystem and the interconnection of these food chains is known as the food web so the organisms occupy a place in the natural surrounding or in a community according to their feeding relationships with other organism because obviously anyone would like to live in the place where it is easy to get the food therefore in a natural surrounding organism occupy a place in the natural surrounding where it can surround itself with the food or where it can maintain a relationship with other organisms that provide them with the food so based on the source of nutrition of food organism can occupy a specific place in the food chain that is known as their trophic level so based on how these what is the source of their nutrition or what is the source of the food the organisms in any food chain occupy a specific place based on their feeding habits and this place is known as their trophic level within that ecosystem for example the producers which are the base of this trophic level that are the first ones that harness the energy are the first trophic level herbivores which are the primary consumers that feed directly on the plants are the second trophic level the carnivores which are the secondary consumers are on the third trophic level so this is how different trophic levels are defined in any food chain so this is an example how the what are the different trophic levels for the different food uh, organisms for example if i talk about the producers so the producers are the first trophic level is the plants that is the producers the second trophic level is the herbivores which are the primary consumers the third trophic level which are the carnivores are the secondary consumers and the fourth tertiary consumers occupies the fourth trophic level which are the top carnivores the examples respective examples of these of the organisms that are present on these trophic levels in an ecosystem include for example at the first trophic level the examples may be phytoplankton grass trees as these are the producers at now at the second trophic level zooplankton grasshopper and cow may exist at the third trophic level birds fishes may exist that feeds on the uh, uh, herbivores and 
on the tertiary at the level of tertiary consumer or the fourth trophic level, which is the top carnivore, man and lion can be the examples. That these are the top carnivores. Now, when we talk about the flow of energy in an ecosystem, it is important to notice that the amount of energy decreases at the successive trophic levels. So, it is not always that the amount of energy which is furnished by the producers is transferred completely or wholly to the primary consumers. Obviously, the producers will utilize some of the energy for themselves and some of the energy will be released in the environment in the form of heat. So, this leads to the decrease in the amount of the energy that is transferred from one trophic level to another trophic level. And as we move on towards the higher levels, higher trophic levels, the amount of energy decreases from the uh, previous level to the next level. So, this amount of energy, so when any organism dies, it is converted to detritus or dead bio, biomass that serves as an energy source for decomposers. Now, organisms at each trophic level depend on those at the lower trophic levels for their energy demands. So, each trophic level has a certain mass of living material at a particular time, which is known as the standing clock. For example, if I talk about the primary consumers, so the mass of the living material at a particular time of the uh, primary consumers is known as the standing crop of that trophic level. So basically, standing, standing crop is a measurement of the mass of the living organism, which is the biomass or the number in a unit area. So how many number of organisms, how many number of primary carnivores are, uh, primary consumers are there, in any particular area will define the standing crop of that particular profit level in that particular area. So the biomass can be expressed in terms of fresh and dry weight, but the dry weight is more accurate. Why it is so? This is because the fresh weight depends a lot on the physiological factors that surrounds the uh, this biomass. For example, if there is a rain it might be that the fresh weight may be more. So, it is the tendency of change in the uh, fresh weight is more as compared to the changes in the dry weight which we observe subsequently that uh, if I have to observe a fresh weight and a dry weight of the organism for a period of time, I will, I will observe that the changes in the fresh weight are more frequent and rapid and also not very constant as compared to the changes in the dry weight with the time. So therefore, the measurement of biomass in terms of the dry weight is more accurate as the fresh weight is also affected a lot by the environmental factors that are surrounding that biomass. The number of trophic levels in the grazing food chain, now since we know that from one trophic level to another trophic level, there is a decrease in the flow of energy. So the number of trophic levels in the grazing food chain is restricted because the every food chain follows a law which is known as the 10% law. So this 10% law is very important. This suggests that only 10% of the energy is transferred to the each trophic level from the lower trophic level. So Suppose in an, any ecosystem, we say that if this law holds true, obviously this is a true. So if considering that 10% law, if I have to see that, if I have to compare two ecosystems where one has organisms up to the three trophic levels, while the other has organisms up to the five trophic levels. So which will be more stable? So definitely the one which has organisms up to the three trophic levels will be more stable, will be more energetic. Why? Because we know that as we move from the producers to the consumers or as we move from one lower trophic level to the higher trophic levels, we found that there is always a decrease in the energy. Now, by considering this, uh, keeping this point in mind that there is a decrease in the 10% amount of energy when we move from one trophic level to another trophic level, 
it may be speculated or it may be expected that the amount of energy which is received by the organisms at the higher trophic levels will be very less. So, more the number of trophic levels, less the number of energy that will be received by the organisms at the highest trophic level. And this energy might not be sufficient for the organism for the to tip, like will not for the better survival. Therefore, it is important that there should be a limited number of organisms that should be involved in any food chain. So we know that in nature it is possible to have so many levels like producers, herbivores, primary consumers, secondary consumers in the grazing food chain. So this is how the energy flow through different trophic levels in an ecosystem. So the sun is the major source of energy in an in ecosystem. It, uh, its energy is harnessed by the plants. Most of its energy is dissipated in the form of heat. While some of the energy, which is 2 to 10% of the total photosynthetically active radiation, which is taken up by the plants. So this, this is the first trophic level producers. Now, uh, when the consumers or the primary consumers or herbivores eat up these plants, some of the energy is again released in the form of heat and only some part of the energy is transferred to the primary consumers or the herbivores. So now when we move towards the third trophic level or the secondary consumers, again some part of the energy in the pro by the process of respiration or by different metabolic processes is released in the form of heat in the environment by the secondary trophic level organisms and only a part of the energy will be transferred to the organisms at the third trophic level or to the secondary consumer. The same case happened at the fourth trophic level. So considering this thing or uh, keeping this view in mind, we can uh, say that if I keep on increasing the number of trophic levels, the amount of energy will keep on decreasing the amount of energy that will be received by the organism at the last or the, the top of the trophic level is uh, very less. Therefore, it is important for the sustainability of the any food chain in an ecosystem that the number of organisms remain uh, less as possible so, so that they all can have a sufficient amount of energy. So, this is just an example. This is an this is an example of how the energy flow takes place in an ecosystem. So the producers are at the base. The producers are the autotrophs. Autotrophs means they are the ones that can synthesize their own food. So the producers are the autotrophs, which by the process of photosynthesis synthesize their own food. So the the examples of producers include the cyanobacteria, phytoplanktons vegetabilia etc these are the organisms at the first trophic level now these uh, producers or the autotrophs are eaten up by the primary consumers which are at the second trophic level so these primary consumers include the herbivores example uh, herbivores that eat the producers and their products for example cow now these primary consumers are eaten up by the secondary consumers which are the carnivores that eats the herbivores and occupies the third trophic level. Then we have the tertiary consumers that are the carnivores that eats on the carnivores itself and they are occupies the fourth trophic level. And then at the apex of any pyramid, energy pyramid, we have the apex predators like alligator, eagle, shark, human, etc. that feeds on the tertiary consumer. So on the right hand side, different trophic levels are mentioned, while on the left hand side of this figure, you can see the values of energy that is getting transferred from one trophic level to another trophic level. So, if I start with one leg joule of energy at the primary, uh, at the energy at the producer level or at the first trophic level, so considering the 10% law, we may calculate that the 10% of one leg is 10,000 which is transferred to the primary consumer. Now, these primary consumers obtain 10,000 joules of energy from, the, from their lower trophic level. Now, if these primary consumers are eaten up by the secondary consumers, so they will transfer, so they will have only the 
thousand joules of energy. That is the ten percent of ten thousand. So in this way, when these secondary consumers are eaten up by the tertiary consumer, only hundred joules of energy will be transferred. And in the last, when these tertiary consumers are eaten up by the apex predator, only ten joules of energy will be transferred. So we can see that starting from the one leg joules or maybe one leg unit of any energy unit of energy, it is only the ten joules of energy from the starting one leg. It is only the ten joules of energy that is uh, available for the organisms that are present at the apex level of the or at the uh, fourth or fifth trophic level of an ecosystem. Therefore, we can see that as we move up. In any ecosystem, or as we move towards the trophic upper trophic levels in any ecosystem, the amount of energy or the amount of uh, available energy for that for the organisms at that trophic level decreases, and it will be the ten percent of the energy that will be available to the previous to the organisms at the previous trophic levels. So this is how the flow of energy takes place in an in an ecosystem. And this example also suggests that why the number of organisms in an ecosystem should be like in any food chain should be should not be more than the uh, should not be more than the fourth trophic level or should not be above the fourth or fifth trophic level as more the number of trophic levels lesser the energy that will be available for the organisms at that trophic level and this will obviously affect their survival. So this was all about the ten percent law or the energy flow within the ecosystem. So this was all about for today's lecture. In the next lecture, we will see that how this energy, like what are the different pyramids, like pyramid of energy, we will discuss in detail, and then we will discuss about different cy nutrient cycling, that how different uh, cycles of different nutrients, like phosphorus cycle, carbon cycle, exist in nature. And how these nutrients are recycled into the environment, starting from one point to the another point. How these nutrients are recycled within the environment. So this we will discuss in the next lecture. With this, I would like to end today's session. So before ending this, I would like to summarize today's session in few words like that. Uh, like in today's lecture, we learn about the energy flow in an ecosystem. The energy flow in an ecosystem always takes place from the lower trophic levels to higher trophic levels, and it is always a unidirectional flow. So this is a unidirectional mechanism of flow of energy from one trophic level to the another trophic level. While the energy is getting transferred from one trophic level to another trophic level, there is always a loss of the amount of energy being transferred, and this law is described by the 10% law that suggests that there is a 10% decrease in the energy, the amount of energy that is transferred from one lower trophic level to the higher trophic level. And based on this, we also can suggest that a stable ecosystem requires a limited number of organisms in any food chain, more the number of food chain, organisms in the food chain or more the higher the number of trophic levels in any food chain will make it unstable as we know that more we progress in the number of trophic levels, lesser, lesser is the energy that will be available to the organisms present at that trophic level, present at higher trophic levels. So therefore, uh, considering all these factors in mind, it is important that any food chain in an ecosystem should be, uh, should have limited number of organisms so that they can self-sustain. Otherwise, there will be the limitation of the energy. So with this, I would like to end today's session. And uh, thank you all for attending this.